Now we discuss the overlapping generations model of diamond in the baseline version. This is based on the original article by Peter Diamond, in, published in 1965 in the American Economic Review, National Debt in the New Classical Growth Model. And textbook treatments can be found in Chapter 9 of Asimoglu, Introduction to Modern Economic Growth, and Chapter 4 of Bretner and Bloom, Automation and its Macroeconomic Consequences, Theory, Evidence, and Social Impacts. Next uh, to the ramsey kass koopmans model, this model of overlapping generations is a second workhorse model uh, widely used in modern dynamic macroeconomics. Due to the structure of the model, as we will see, it's very well suited for analyzing long-run uh, growth phenomena, and particularly those that are uh, related to demographic changes, because as we will see, one time period corresponds to one generation in the model, and therefore one can analyze uh, changes of uh, fertility and how that affects the relative size of cohorts between older cohorts and younger cohorts, how this affects um, social security contributions and the sustainability of pension schemes, and so on and so forth. But in the basic version, the main question is the following. We have seen that in the solo swan model, the saving rate was exogenously given. But in reality, we know that saving, consumption saving decision of households is one of the most important economic decisions that households make. So therefore, this is not a parameter, but it's a decision variable actually of households. And one way to endogenize the decision of households, uh, how much they would like to save, is by means of the structure of the overlapping generations model and uh, the optimization problem that it uh, implies. The other way of endogenizing the consumption savings decision is, as it is done in continuous time in the ramsey kass koopmans uh, model, with continuous time dynamic optimization. So for those who are interested in this, I recommend the videos on the ramsey kass koopmans model. What are the basic assumptions and what is the basic structure of the overlapping generations model? Well, time t now evolves uh, discreetly and is denoted by uppercase t and goes from zero to infinity, basically, in the model. Individuals live for two time periods. That's deterministic. Uh, so they are born, uh, then they live for one time period. Uh, that's kind of um, when they are young adults. And then uh, in the second period of their life, they are old adults. And after the second period, they die for sure. So after two time periods, life is over. Now, in each period, a new generation is born. That is then uh, the young generation. Uh, and that means that at each point in time, two generations are alive at the same time. So if we aggregate over the cohorts in the economy, we have young workers in the economy and older retirees. So the generations overlap. So the young are the ones who supply their labor on the labor market. They earn wages and they have the consumption uh, savings decision. And uh, the older adults live out of their savings that they carried over from the period when they uh, supplied their labor on the labor market, so when they were young. Now, that's a similar structure as uh, retirement in a fully funded pension system, when people would save for themselves when they are retired later on. An alternative pension scheme that is often analyzed within the overlapping generations model is a pay-as-you-go pension system, where the currently living young people actually uh, pay a fraction of their wages to support those who are in retirement and to pay their pensions. And this can be easily analyzed in an overlapping generations model. So the main point is that the young now need to decide how much of their total wage income they want to consume and how much they want to save for retirement. This determines the saving decision in the model endogenously. Here we have a graphical depiction of the demographic structure of the model. So we have that on the horizontal axis we have time, so time evolves. Here is period T, that's the current period, then period T plus 1, T plus 2, and so on. And here we would have the past, period T minus 1. Now, um, in period T, 
those people still live and are in old age that were born in period T minus 1, that were young in period T minus 1. And we have a new generation uh, that is born at the beginning of uh, period T, and that's the new young generation. So then from period T onwards, they live again and grow old in period T plus 1. So then the previous, the, those who were previously old, they die. The ones that were previously young, they grow old. And a new generation is again born. So we have here uh, at the horizontal axis, we have the life cycle of individuals. So they are young first and old uh, in the second period. And along the vertical axis, we actually have the aggregate economy. So if we look from this side upwards, we see that at each point in time, young and old persons are living at the same time. So if we aggregate the economy, we have to take the sum over the currently living uh, generations. And if we have, uh, assume a life cycle perspective, then we look uh, at the model from this side, basically, and see that uh, the cohort perspective, that people are young first and old later. Well, and this goes on and on, and at each point in time, two generations overlap. So now from the individual life cycle perspective, individuals are born, then they work and decide how much of their wage income they want to consume and how much they want to save for the second period of their life. In the second period, they consume out of their savings. And here we make a simplification, and that is that individuals uh, do not have intergenerational altruism. That means there are no bequests and people consume all of their assets in the second period of their life. Now, bequests can be easily introduced by various means. One would be to introduce intergenerational altruism. Another could be that there are unintentional bequests when people are uncertain about the date when they will die. For example, if there is a third period into which uh, individuals live with a certain probability, then there could be um, unintentional bequests as well. But here, in the basic model, we uh, are not concerned with bequests, which makes the analysis much easier. Um, individuals supply one unit of labor on the labor market and then they use this to consume in the first period and save for consumption in the second period. So utility itself depends on consumption in the first period and consumption in the second period. It's additively separable, so we assume that uh, the two utilities in the first and in the second period just add up. And utility of the second period is discounted with the discount factor beta. Better is between 0 and 1, so that means people have a certain impatience, and this impatience means that they have a preference for consumption today, and they weight down consumption utility in the future by this factor. So the smaller better is, the less weight people put into the future, so the more impatient people are. What we also assume here is that the um, period utility functions are logarithmic, uh, that's a specific form of the utility function where income effects and substitution effects cancel each other off. So, for example, if the interest rate increases, that would mean that on the one hand, people might want to save more because um, what they receive as interest payments on their savings increases. So that would be the substitution effect. They would want to save more. But at the same time, it implies that people have more income. They have more asset income. And this would lead them to consume more also in the first period of their lives. And that's the income effect that would say there is paribus reduce um, savings. And if these two effects um, cancel each other off, that's uh, exactly the case when we have a logarithmic utility function. So when we have a logarithmic utility function, income and substitution effects cancel each other off. And this enables actually an analytical solution of this overlapping generations model usually. So many overlapping generations models that you will see have a logarithmic utility function exactly because of that, that they um, should be analytically solvable. Of course, one could also go the alternative direction, and there are many such models that are not analytically solvable, but just numerically uh, solvable to simulate them um, in, in uh, software. Uh, and then it doesn't uh, matter, so you can also introduce all other types of utility functions and in principle also many different generations. So large-scale computable overlapping generations models consist of up to 100 uh, different generations where each year is a generation and so on, but there is no chance that such a model could be solved analytically. They can only be solved on a computer and 
it, then um, one can draw certain conclusions based on the outcomes. However, here we focus on an analytically tractable model, and the next step in building this model is to discuss the budget constraint. We start this by discussing the part of the cut budget constraint that refers to the first period of uh, the individual life cycle. That's when individuals are young and supply their labor on the labor market. Well, then they earn a wage income denoted by WT. And this can be used to pay for consumption, CT, or to save the amount ST for the next period. Now, Savings earn an interest, the interest rate R, and therefore second period income depends on asset income, so it's solely determined by asset income, and the higher the interest rate is, the higher is second period income. And individuals can use second period income for uh, consuming second period consumption, so CT plus 1 would then be the total amount of savings that I carry over from the previous period when I'm young and work, but multiplied by 1 plus the interest rate because I get the interest payments R times S when I move from the first to the second uh, period. Now what's important here in this context is also to remember again that this is a generational perspective. So it's an intergenerational interest rate. So when calibrating this model, one always has to be aware of the fact that the interest rate can be rather high because it does not refer to only one year, but to say 25 years, which would be a typical time span assumed for a generation in such a model. Well, now we have the part of the budget constraint that refers to the first period and the one that refers to the second period. And putting these two together, we can then write down the intertemporal budget constraint. So we see this here. We can isolate savings by dividing CT plus 1 by 1 plus RT plus 1. And then we plug in ST here. And what we get is the lifetime budget constraint that states that the present value of wage income that's just WT, because in the second period, individuals do not have a wage income, is equal to the present value of consumption. That's the value of consumption in the first period and the value of consumption in the second period, which is discounted with the interest rate RT. So this means that individuals cannot consume more than their wage income. And uh, since we don't allow for bequests, they also do not uh, consume less. So we actually have an equality constraint here. And so we can straightforwardly apply uh, the Lagrangian uh, method for computing uh, the optimal consumption savings decision. Um, this is also uh, due to the fact that this uh, model has two time periods. So it's rather easy to apply the Lagrangian uh, procedure to this um, model because we don't have infinitely many time periods when it would be rather cumbersome in some instances to use uh, the Lagrangian method to derive the optimal. So now we do just that. We solve the utility maximization problem of households by using the method of Lagrange. So the first step is to write down the Lagrangian function. That's just the um, utility function plus the Lagrange multiplier times the constraint where we write uh, the wages here um, and subtract consumption in the first period and discounted consumption from the second period from these wages. Well, and then we already know um, from the uh, videos on dynamic optimization in discrete time that we have uh, three choice variables now. So consumption in the first period and consumption in the second period. Uh, but we also have the Lagrange multiplier. And uh, for the necessary first order conditions, we have to take the derivative of the Lagrangian with respect to these uh, choice variables and the Lagrange multiplier and set them equal to zero. So that's exactly what we do here. Uh, we take the derivative with respect to the first um, period consumption level, set it equal to zero. We see this is one over CT. And here we have minus lambda. So if we reformulate this, what uh, remains on the right-hand side is that lambda is equal to 1 over CT. We can do the same with respect to period 2 consumption. So that's the derivative of the Lagrangian with respect to CT plus 1. So that would uh, provide us with uh, beta over CT plus 1. That's here. And then we have uh, minus lambda times um, uh, divided by 1 plus RT plus 1. Again, if we reformulate, then we get this expression here. 
And finally, if we take the derivative with respect to the Lagrange multiplier, we again get the lifetime budget constraint. And now we can derive by means of the first first order condition and the second first order condition, the main insight from the consumption optimization uh, problem of households, the so-called Keynes-Ramsey rule, so actually the optimal evolution of consumption over time. How do we get this? Well, we just plug in lambda here, so we get rid of lambda in the second expression. Then we see we would have 1 over ct times 1 plus rt here on the right hand side. So then we can just um, multiply by consumption. We get consumption the first period divided by consumption the second period. We divide by beta. Then we would have 1 over beta times 1 plus rt. And then we can switch the numerator and the denominator. And what we would finally end up is this expression here, where we have uh, consumption in the second period divided by consumption in the first period. And that's optimal consumption, actually is a function of the discount factor and the interest rate, basically, that we will uh, interpret on the next slide. So now, what does this Keynes-Ramsey rule mean? It means that we have the growth factor of consumption on the left-hand side. And now, if the growth factor of consumption is larger than one, then we have consumption growth, because then period two consumption is greater than period one consumption. Only then this whole expression would be greater than one. By contrast, if ct plus one is uh, smaller than ct, then this expression would be smaller than one and we have consumption decline actually. So consumption growth and consumption decline are separated by um, uh, here the left hand side being equal uh, to one. Now what does this depend? Well, on the product that we have on the right-hand side, so on the discount factor multiplied by 1 plus the interest rate. Now we see already, if the discount factor is rather small and the interest rate is not very high, then we could have the situation that the right-hand side is smaller than 1. So in this case, the financial market does not compensate uh, households fully for their impatience. In that case, it would be optimal for the household to consume more in the first period of their life than in the second period of their life, and they would run um, their consumption. They, they would they would uh, have a decreasing consumption path over their life cycle. By contrast, if the financial markets overcompensate households for their impatience, then the interest rate would be rather high. Uh, probably better would be not so low, such that the total, uh, so the product on the right hand side is uh, greater than one. In this case, households would want to shift consumption from the first period into the second because they earn enough interest income on their savings such that they are compensated for their impatience. And in this case, um, uh, they would have a positive growth, uh, consumption growth trajectory over uh, their life cycle. So, uh, Greater discount factor puts more weight on second period consumption, so then people are less impatient. That zeta res paribus raises consumption growth, and the higher interest rate also zeta res paribus increases consumption growth because it means that the financial markets um, have a higher compensation for the impatience of households. Now we can use the Keynes Ramsey rule to isolate consumption in the second period. So that would be that we just multiply it by consumption the first period and then plug in consumption the second period into the budget constraint. So here, what we get then is this expression. And here we see that one plus the interest rate drop out. So then we get um, that uh, wages and consumption in the first period are related such that uh, consumption in the first period is actually the wages divided by one plus beta, if we reformulate the whole thing. So optimal consumption in this model would imply that people consume a fraction of their income in the first period of their lives. And this fraction is determined by their impatience, so beta. The higher beta is, the less impatient households are, and that means they would consume a smaller fraction of their wage income in the first period. This is clear because if they are less impatient, they want to save more for the next period. 
So the consumption share is 1 over 1 plus beta. And the household saved the rest, so we can easily compute out of this consumption share the saving share or the saving rate, which is just 1 minus this consumption expression here, 1 over 1 plus beta, that I denote uh, in a slight abuse of uh, notation with uh, C, because here CT is actually overall consumption, so multiplied by the wages, and here I just denote this term here by C without the T index, um, but yeah, it's a slight abuse of notation. So then the saving rate can be calculated as 1 minus uh, this expression, um, C, so 1 minus um, 1 over 1 plus beta, and if we do the calculations, so we have here 1 plus beta divided by 1 plus beta minus 1, so what we get is a saving rate of beta divided by 1 plus beta. So this also shows that the saving rate is also between 0 and 1, as is the, um, this fraction of consumption out of wages. And what we could also um, show is that savings increase with beta. So if you take the derivative of S with respect to beta, you will see that the result is positive. So the saving rate increases with beta because people become less impatient if beta uh, increases, and that means they would save more. Up to now, we've talked about the consumption side of the we have shown how households uh, determine optimally their consumption and savings choice given the interest rate and given the wage rate. Now we want to close the model again such that wages and um, the interest rate are actually determined in general equilibrium. So what we need to close the model is the production side of the economy. And here we again assume a Cobb-Douglas production function with the difference to the solo model and the ramsey kass koopmans model so far being that we do not assume labor augmenting technological progress, but we just write technology outside um, as a scaling factor of the production function. But we leave it constant anyway, so it does not have any implications now for the model. So we have that output is produced with the constant technologies, A, capital with an output elasticity of alpha, and labor with an output elasticity 1 minus alpha. And now in the basic framework, it's again the case that we have perfectly competitive markets. So the factor rewards will again be the marginal products. So the factor reward of uh, capital, so the capital rental rate, which is the interest rate plus the rate of depreciation, is the derivative of the production function with respect to the production factor capital. And the wage rate is the derivative of the production function with respect to labor input. Now, if we take this derivative, what we get is, um, here we take the derivative with respect to k. So alpha comes down from the exponent, multiplies with the whole production function, because the rest is unchanged here, except for the fact that the exponent of capital reduces by minus 1. So we have this expression here. And then we can just, again, reformulate, because that's nothing else than capital per worker to the power of alpha minus 1, because we can write labor in the denominator if we multiply the exponent of labor by minus 1. So then we would have this expression for the interest rate alpha times A times capital per worker. So it's again the capital intensity to the power of alpha minus 1. Probably one um, thing uh, is noteworthy here, and that's that in this model, capital per worker and capital per capita do not coincide anymore. And the reason is that we have retirees who are not workers. So the total population size is now not anymore equivalent to the total um, workforce. Aside from that, the wages are then the derivative of the production function with respect to labor input. So if we take this derivative, then 1 minus alpha comes down from the exponent here, and the exponent of labor is reduced by 1. So we have minus alpha here in the exponent, and again we can write k to the power of alpha multiplied by l to the power of minus alpha as lowercase k, so capital per worker to the power of alpha. So these are the factor rewards. And now we uh, want to derive the capital accumulation equation. Now, what is a gross investment in this model? Now, gross investment in this model is the saving rate multiplied by wages of one person that is working, multiplied by the total number of people that are on the labor market that uh, earn wage income. So that would be total savings 
and total savings again are equal to total investment. Now there is a crucial difference to the solo model and that is that in the overlapping generations model, as we see, people only save out of labor income. In the solo model, they saved out of labor income and out of capital income. And also in the ramsey kass koopmans model, actually, they save out of capital income because from, from the first instant onwards, uh, people save and therefore they have capital income. Uh, they have savings and capital income. In the overlapping generations model, by contrast, we assumed no bequests. And that means the first period of life, in the first period of life, people do not have capital. So they do not have asset income. They can only save out of labor income. When we discuss automation in the overlapping generations model, this will be a crucial point because that will basically drive the results of why automation does not lead to similar results with respect to long-run economic growth in the overlapping generations framework as compared to the standard solo framework. Well, now with this gross investment, um, uh, expression here, we can write down the aggregate capital accumulation again, because the aggregate capital stock in the second period is now what is invested in period T, plus the capital that is still there from the previous period. So that's capital from period T minus the depreciated capital from period T, so the depreciation rate times the capital stock. So that's the capital carried over, and that's the new investment. And both of this determines uh, the capital stock in the next period. Now we make another simplifying assumption. We assume that the cohort size stays constant over time. So we do not have population growth. LT and LT plus 1 is the same, and we normalize it to 1. Now that means that we can just, from the aggregate capital accumulation equation, we can just rewrite it as the per the capital per worker capital accumulation equation when we substitute all the uppercase um, k um, terms by lowercase k and lt becomes 1. So we then have the capital accumulation equation per worker that increases with uh, saving per worker and decreases with uh, depreciation of capital per worker. And now, uh, to close the model and derive one equation that describes the evolution of the capital stock per worker over time, we can plug in the saving rate, which would still be uh, endogenous here. The saving rate is beta over 1 plus beta, so it's uh, determined by parameter values, so we can substitute it out. And for WT, we plug in uh, the wage rate in the economy from the previous uh, slide, so we plug in wages. Uh, here. Now what we get is then the capital accumulation equation in the form that is equivalent to what we had in the solo model, although there it was written down in continuous time. So we have that capital per worker at time t plus 1 is again a positive function of um, uh, total uh, gross investment, but gross investment is now uh, beta over 1 plus beta, which is the saving rate, multiplied by the wage rate. And here we have uh, capital depreciation, so 1 minus delta times um, kt. So the equation looks similar as in the solo swan framework, except for the fact, as I uh, said previously, so it's uh, in discrete time. Saving is just out of wage income, not out of total income, so wage income plus capital income. Um, and these are the crucial differences. Uh, and particularly, uh, the saving rate, of course, is endogenous in this framework. So in contrast to the solo framework, we really have optimal behavior of households in the background. Now we can analyze the model dynamics by means of a graph. Here we plot kt on the horizontal axis, so that's the capital stock at time t. And on the vertical axis, we plot um, the capital stock at time t plus 1, so that's capital in the next period. Now we know from this expression here that a steady state means that capital at time t plus 1 is equal to capital at time t, because then by definition capital does not change anymore over time. So we know that all these steady states could only be located along the 45 degree line from the origin because this, these are all the points at which capital at time t is equal to capital at time t plus 1. 
Well, and then we also need to plot this equation here. And we know again that this equation is concave in capital at time t, because here we have an exponent that is smaller than 1. <coughs> and here we have no exponent. So here we just have 1. And we subtract uh, delta actually from 1. So here this um, expression is definitely smaller than 1. So this um, coefficient of capital at time t. So therefore we know that if we start with a low capital stock, this expression uh, plus 1 times k will for sure be higher than minus delta uh, k. So at the origin, we have that this will for sure lie above the 45 degree line. But then as capital accumulates, this term here will become uh, smaller and smaller because of the diminishing marginal product with respect to capital. And at some point, it will drop below the 45 degree line because this term here is below 1 and this term here will become smaller and smaller. So at some point, it will definitely cross the 45 degree line. And the point at which this capital at time t plus 1 curve crosses the 45 degree line is the steady state of the model. In this point, again, we have a capital stock K star per worker that does not change anymore. It's the same in period t and in period t plus 1. What does this imply again for the model dynamics? Well, we have a similar situation as in the Solo model and in the ramsey kass koopmans model. We could start with the capital stock K0 below the steady state capital stock K star. Now, if we start at such a K0, then we can read off by this function KT plus 1 that we have here, the capital stock at time T plus 1. So that would then be on this curve here and would be higher than K0. So in the next period, we are already at the capital stock K1. Then we can read off again what the corresponding capital stock at time 2 would be. It would be higher because it's again along the kt plus 1 curve. So then we have capital at time t plus 1. What's capital at time t plus 3? Well, it's again higher and so on and so forth. So we would again have convergence from the capital stock at time 0 towards the steady state capital stock. So initially these steps would be higher, uh, so the convergence would be faster, and the closer we get to the steady state capital stock, the uh, sl slower convergence would become. However, we would again converge to this equilibrium from below. And by contrast, if we start with a capital stock that is higher than the steady state capital stock K star, we converge to the capital stock at the steady state from above. So we again have the situation, as in the Solo model, as in the ramsey kass koopmans model, that we can explain convergence phases and phases of economic decline after, for example, a forced saving rate would have been too high to sustain in the long run. So altogether, again, the model predicts similar uh, qualitative findings as the Solo model and as the ramsey kass koopmans model. So we can again explain convergence with this overlapping generations framework. To summarize, the steady state is again unique and globally stable. As in the Solo Swan model and as in the ramsey kass koopmans model, we have convergence and this can explain situations such as the economic miracle after World War II in the countries that were uh, directly evolved in the one where the capital stock was uh, destroyed to a large extent. And what we also have is a micro foundation for the saving rate. That's in contrast to the solo model, but in line with the ramsey kass koopmans model. But in the ramsey kass koopmans model, the framework was in continuous time. And the saving rate was pinned down by um, actually the consumption Euler equation and the capital accumulation equation. And here the saving rate is explicitly calculated as beta over 1 plus beta. And now if beta changes, that changes the consumption savings behavior. If beta increases, people become more patient, so they save more. And that would mean that the steady state capital stock increases. So it would shift the KT plus 1 curve upwards and we would have an intersection with the 45 degree line and a higher capital stock per worker. So again, we can explain cross-country differences in investment uh, in per capita GDP by differences in investment decisions. 
Where does this leave us? Again, as I said at the beginning, uh, the overlapping generations model is a second workhorse model of modern dynamic macroeconomics. It's uh, very often used and particularly well suited for analyzing questions related to long-run economic uh, development. And so small extensions of the model uh, can already yield quite important insights. So for example, one can use the model to introduce bequests and intergenerational altruism to analyze bequest dynamics over time and the effects of capital taxation and so on. Fertility dynamics and population growth are often also analyzed within overlapping generations framework uh, works because the fertility decision is uh, typically much uh, easier to endogenize in such a framework than in a continuous time uh, model. The same holds true for education decisions. Endogenous education decisions are typically <clears throat> uh, analyzed within such a model and not within the continuous time framework, again, because it's usually easier done um, and can yeah, the extension is uh, more straightforward. Particularly well suited um, is the overlapping generations model to analyze governmental transfers and pension schemes because one can analyze which cohort benefits, which cohort does not benefit, which cohort pays the costs and so on and so forth. As I said before also, one can introduce uh, very easily a formal pay-as-you-go pension system where the young workers are basically paying the pensions of the older retirees. And governmental debt dynamics are also often analyzed within such an overlapping generations model because of the heterogeneity that we have, where we can analyze uh, who pays the debt in the end. So, um, for example, older individuals might benefit from um, governmental uh, expenditures because they do not pay back the debt in the future. So these will be paid back by the workers and so on and so forth. <clears throat> so the model is very well suited to analyze these long run dynamics and is particularly um, a very good tool when the timing that we have is uh, a timing over generations and not so much uh, over quarters uh, and things like that. So it's less well suited to analyze uh, monetary policies and things like that that have a rather short uh, run time horizon. So thank you very much uh, for your attention and we will then also discuss extensions of the model, for example, towards the analysis of poverty traps and towards the analysis of automation.